I like to um, work on many things at a time. So this is kind of my traditional way to be working. It, it's kind of like working in a series. Um, here's another 12 by 12 inch panel just to kind of keep things sort of the same. Uh, before I start putting the color on, you know, it is it's often good just to warm that surface up a little bit. Okay, so let me just, I'm, I'm trying to think of like different things that I can do here. So let me start out with this glaze over here. I've been um, playing a lot with glazes lately. And the beautiful thing about it is as they overlap, and, and also like one thing I love about this medium, and it probably has to do with my tremendous impatience for everything. <laughs> I do like to see things happen quickly. Now you can overlap this um, before I fuse it in. I mean, that that's a very thin layer of overlap. So, you know, the main thing is that you're gonna fuse it in. And so I might change that color a little bit, just put a few drops of the quinacridone in there. A little bit of paint goes a long way. And then I will fuse this in. Just lovely colors. I'm gonna fuse it in now. Working large is, is definitely, um, <laughs> Well, I work on large cradle panels when I work large. And so um, I was working toward the, the radius show and um, you know, the boards, I was working on a four foot by six foot. So I know a lot of people like to scale up, but when you do that, you know, you kind of have to deal with bigger tools and heavier boards and, and all those things. So, um, but this is a very, as you can see, very sensitive surface. Uh, the mark making that happens when you press tools into it, that's that's one way to make a mark. But then obviously you've got your paint and you can mix your paints. So just like you do any other medium, I mean, there's so many uh, things you can do in this medium that are somewhat like other mediums. Uh, you can use RNF pigment sticks and you can use a lot of the same dry media like art graph. I have art graph here. I have my woodies, um, pan pastel. So if you already have that kind of stuff, then you'll find that you can actually use a lot of those same things. And that's really fun. It was nice when you don't have to start all over with everything. Okay, I made a little bit more of a warm color. Does anyone have any questions right now? Pam, we have so many questions. <laughs> and and, and the, uh, the comments have been so wonderful at, at helping each other. Um, so folks, I, I'm going to try to grab some of the questions. Uh, sure. Just, But you know, if I miss it, we'll try to leave time at the end. Uh, yeah. One of the ones I saw, and I'm going to bring some of these questions on screen, Pam. You, don't, awesome. you can't see them, but I, I'm going to do it for folks oh, watching oh. this after. Um, yeah. Wendy asks, where do you get your boards? Uh, ampersand? Oh, okay. The ampersand boards, they're really available, um, you know, just about anywhere. Dick Blick, Amazon, um, uh, you know, you can look up ampersand as a company. They're a family owned company, which is one reason why I absolutely love to give them business. Uh, they are in Buda, Texas and um, just wonderful customer service and excellent videos. So I would just say that, you know, I think you'd be hard pressed not to find them and they come in all different sizes and it's already treated with RNF gesso, which means that's why it's white, which is lovely. Like I love that part. So, yeah. Thank you for that, Pam. And again, I'm only going to grab a few right now. We'll, we'll leave sure. a bunch for the end. One of the things that I've actually seen quite a few people uh, bring up is just like, you know, the, perhaps the fear of switching to the blowtorch, right? Because it is quite the leap. <laughs> Can you just talk a bit about like how that journey was for you? Because obviously yeah. probably didn't start with the, the huge blowtorch, but you, you know. Um, you know, let's see. Uh, I did have a heat gun, but that is a totally different situation. Uh, I would say if you're a little bit shy with the uh, propane, then yeah, start with the heat gun and, and that'll get you really far. There are some techniques that you actually 
kind of need the heat gun. You can't be, you can't use really um, the propane torch. It might, if you're working on say multimedia artboard, you're gonna wanna use a heat gun. If you're trying to work with say collage material, a lot of times that's gonna mean you want to use a heat gun. Propane, um, gosh, yeah, there's a bit of a learning curve, but actually it's not um, as bad as you might think it is. It's just like anything, getting used to it, I think. And I just love it because like mine, my particular one has a, a switch where like you press this red button and, and then you get the flame going and then you hit the silver button and then you don't touch anything. You're just like free to, to heat it. And then when you're done, you press this red button again and it, it all goes off. So it's um, just like anything, you get used to it. And um, once you, once you kind of use it, then um, <laughs> for me anyways, and I actually have another, I have a, like, you know, when you go camping, you've got those large propane tanks. I actually have a nozzle hose connected to that. And so, yeah, I, I again, I, I just tend to really like the propane. So any other questions or? Yeah, I'm going to grab one more. And if you want, we can either check in with some students yeah, or we can cruise on this one. The one I wanted to grab is just because I know it's a common question is just regarding like ventilation and toxicity, right? Uh, do, can you speak a bit to that? And perhaps I know we showed your workshop in the bit the beginning, but just maybe speak a bit more about your setup. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a great question. And I'm really glad you asked it. Uh, the one thing about uh, working with beeswax. So this is um, encaustic medium is made with um, two components. It's made with Damar resin, which is this chunky stuff, and beeswax, uh, and you melt them together and you make these, um, you can make your own encaustic medium. <laughs> okay, so you make your own encaustic medium. Yeah, you didn't, you didn't see that. Um, it looks like this, and you can make it very inexpensively and that kind of thing. Now, the one thing you have to watch out for is smoke. So when you heat your griddle, you heat your paints, like I've got, you know, heated paint here. I have an infrared thermometer and I just point it just like during COVID and you know, everybody's having one of these pointed at their forehead. I point it at my panes and you just want to make sure that temperature is like between say, you've got a range between 150 and say 200 and you're not going to see smoke. It's when you get up to well above 200 that you might see some smoke. I think that when I first got started, I had no fancy ventilation. I had an open window. I had a window that slid open. I had a door that could open to the outside. I was in a garage and that was all great. Uh, now I'm in a, a, a closed, I'm below ground. So I actually had to bring some ventilation in, but it doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be expensive. Just an open window and open door. But yes, that's a great question. And if you want to ask questions, like I'm perfectly fine answering questions while I paint. That's what I, you know, like I'm really used to doing that. So if yep. you want to do that, it's fine too. What I would love is if folks, if I know I've missed a bunch of questions and we've had so many comments since then, if folks can actually put in the comments, uh, you know, if you have an open question for Pam, we could start actually bringing some of these up and, and kind of going through them. So anyways, I did recently post a YouTube video. It's just called My Encaustic Life. If anybody's interested, it kind of shows my history in this medium. And I'm really amazed at how much it has influenced everything I did since learning this medium. Uh, I started with watercolor when our two boys were young. I did that for about 10 years. Plateaued, um, took a 10 year break. And then I got back into like acrylic mixed media. And uh, that was great. Just, you know, kind of started painting again and, and that felt really nice. But uh, then I, that's when I saw this encaustic painting in 2008. And at that time our boys were growing older and I decided to go to grad school. So I got my MFA um, at the University of Montana School of Art. But uh, I, um, it was right at the time that I started grad school that I had just learned encaustic. So I was kind of like, how can I use encaustic, you know, to, in my thesis work and, and that kind of thing. And everything just for me seems very organic, like how things unfold. And I don't, I don't know. It's just interesting how uh, my mediums have changed, but but there's a lot of crossover. Um, I'm always trying to be true to my voice, regardless of what medium I'm working in. Um, and I, I try to let the medium sort of do a little bit about what it wants to do, but but I also know what I want. So it has to comply with me as well. So I, I'm very much about color and design. I don't really, I'm not a really um, like, 
I, I, I just don't think technique is ever enough. And so my course, um, the Powerful Design and Personal Color, emphasizes color and design regardless of what medium you're working in. And um, I just feel that that is really going to be the most important thing you're going to learn to get the results that you really want, to find your personal voice. And um, technique is great. Of course, you have to do some technique. But when you know what you want and you know what your voice is, you will figure it out. Um, the technique can follow um, once you've done your other kind of homework. <laughs> Yeah, this is just very much a layering process, and you can kind of see that the beautiful thing that I love about encaustic, I mean, there are a few things. Okay, I'll, there, there are a few that I, I just absolutely have to tell you. Um, number one is pretty fast. You can kind of see how quickly you can create something, and, you know, the as far as, like, the explore and the clarify stages, you know, the finesse is what I'll do with my woodies and my pan pastels and my Sorrel transfer paper and all that kind of stuff. But the other thing I love about it is that there's really no cleanup. And I know that it's really pathetic to say that, but um, you just unheat your appliances and you're done. Like there's no having to clean all these tools. And I think that that's, that's actually kind of one of the things I enjoy about it. So um, so for folks who are joining us late, I think uh, there's been quite a few questions about the name of the board with wax you're using as a starter. Can you oh, re repeat yes. some of that stuff again? Yes, absolutely. I'm going to turn it around. Um, now, you probably can't see that very well, but it says encaustic board. It's made by ampersand. So encaustic, but you spell out the word and then it's B-O-R-D. It's made by ampersand, A-M-P-E-R-S-A-N-D. And they have so many different kinds of boards. They have, uh, I've got these little samples. I'm one of their ambassadors and... So here's, they come in all different sizes, uh, clay board, scratch board, aqua board, pastel board, and they sell frames that are just meant for this, you know, particular size. Um, and it's just, again, it's just such an awesome company. Um, I'm going to be doing a, um, a chat with Dana, who is um, the owner there pretty soon. It'll be on my YouTube channel because I, I reached out to him and I was like, you know, I just really want people to know about your product. And so um, stay tuned for that. It's coming. Thank you for that, Pam. Um, in, in, in the beginning, right, you had your whole box of goodies. And I, I remember specifically you had like the the, the chainsaw chain. Um, and you also at one point uh, had a small roller tool with a light brown handle. Um, okay. One of the one of our viewers has asked what that was. This one, right? Probably this one. Um, yeah, I, I think it um, yeah, it probably was this one. And I this is a very funny thing. Like when I teach workshops and I, I've taught workshops around the world. This one that I went to was in Texas and I was walking around one of the, it was a cold wax and oil workshop. And, um, one gal had like all three of these and I was like, what are those? Where do you get them? There's like a third one here too, but I don't have it in front of me. Oh, here it is. It's really big. These are uh, listed on my resource page. Cause I can't remember the name, but they have to do with tires of all things. Uh, so if you go to artandsuccess.com and then click on resources, scroll down and, and, and they have to do with like, they, they deaden tires. <laughs> that, these are so much fun. And I use these like in, in all the different mediums, cold wax and oil, they certainly work in encaustic, you know, and you can bring out these marks. It's very cool. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. And if you have any follow-up questions and you're following along, feel free to put them in uh, the chat. We'll try to grab as many as we could. Pam, are you up for another question? I got another one for you. Of course. Well, because this is more about the blowtorch, my favorite topic. <laughs> the, do you, you know, the question is, do you ever blowtorch the paint to a point where it moves the paint around in different shapes? Oh, yeah. I mean, that that that's why I mentioned my son, because I taught him how to, to paint with encaustic and you know, there are some people who just love to see the swirly thing going on. And that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, if you heat something long enough, you're going to start to see the paint move and then it becomes marbled. And um, so it is a meth of, of sort of like, how much do you want it to do that? You have full control over that it does take some practice. But, um, you know, I, I oftentimes have some delicate things going on. So I have to be a little bit careful with my torch. But and again, if you use a heat gun, then it's a little bit, you know, like that's less aggressive. So if you don't, you know, the propane torch, it does have controls, but I would say the heat gun usually also has two different levels of heat and you have control with that as well. So
so um, you just kind of have to pick your heat source. So there I put on the RNF pigment stick and it went over that little wheel tool. Um, and that's the kind of texture you get. It's just really fun. Yeah, any other questions? I'm gonna grab another one. Uh, so this question is, uh, Julie noticed that you're mixing colors right in the heated dishes. You know, do you end up with muddy colors? Is that not, that not a problem at all? Um, you know, it, it does take some understanding of color. Uh, and that's where, again, you know, I just have to stress that I, I didn't know much about color in the early days. I had to, you know, I had to learn. And it all has to do with, um, like, a cool color can be warm, and a warm color can be cool. If you understand the, the science or the theory of color, and it's really not that complicated, but if you don't know it, then, um, you know, like, you'll get mud. And, and there's nothing wrong with mud because mud is a gray. But um, the thing about mud is that there are times when you actually want mud. And, but if you don't understand color and you get mud, then you usually end up being kind of sad because you weren't expecting that. But if you're expecting it, um, and you, in, in, in fact, sometimes you, you want to create mud, then the more you understand about color, um, you know, the better off you're going to be. It's just, it um, decreases the learning curve when you put in the time to understand just a little bit about color. It's really not that complicated, and that's one thing I do teach um, in my course. Any other questions? Thank you, Pam. Well, can you talk a bit about the, the different coats when we were first starting out, right? I know you talked about preparing the board, and I've seen a bunch of different comments uh, in the chat of folks like, you know, kind of talking through their process. Can you just repeat yours? Okay, um, so in my case, what I did for this demo today was I chose, you know, I, I was considering doing like working on six by six inch cradle panel. I could have worked on ampersand panel, um, or I could have worked on multimedia artboard or even um, um, Strathmore illustration board. But I decided to use, you know, one of my favorite services. Again, these are encaustic boards. So what I did, I put um, a coat of beeswax and then I fused it. I put another coat of beeswax and I fused it. And then the uh, third layer was encaustic medium. And I do like things really smooth. So I probably heated this uh, because, you know, you get brush strokes and everything. But depending on how you heat it, I mean, this is completely smooth. Uh, there's there's no no brush strokes at all. Now, other times you, you might want to have those brush strokes. But in my case, I didn't want to. So then my next stage is to essentially play. That might mean texturing first. It might mean putting color on first. Um, there's no any like one way that I always play and I encourage other people to kind of find their way to play that they enjoy. So um, that's kind of what today is about is just letting you know that like these are not meant to be finished works at all. They're meant to show you that um, you can play in encaustic. You've seen other students working in acrylic, cold wax and oil. Um, it's not about the medium. It's about process. It's about the way you think or the and, and that there is a time to think and a time not to think. So I definitely have to start thinking as, as things progress along. But I've learned that in my own work, I have to put that to the side and not think um, so that I'm allowed to just explore. Um, sometimes you make great discoveries when you just um, allow yourself to play and not get uptight about the finished product. Um, worrying about the finished product is such a, um, it can really shut you down and um, it causes a lot of people to get very frustrated. <laughs> and so um, personally that happened to me. That's why I know that it happens. And so, yeah. Thank you for that, Pam. And a, a recent question is, so between layers, you were, uh, you had a squirt bottle that you were putting onto the, the canvas. Can you go uh, Explain what was in that squirt bottle. You're using that before you wipe down layers. Oh, I think it was this. You mean yes, this? Yes, okay. yes, yes. Yeah, this is just cooking oil. And you use cooking oil. So, like, um, this is one thing that, again, I'm describing it in my mini course. It's so funny because, like, right now I'm just, like, putting it together. But whenever you've got anything oily, and, and again, you don't want to leave a lot of oil on the surface. So, like, RNF pigment sticks or if it's oil paint, because you can use both of those things to fill in these textural areas you need to remove the majority of it. And I use cooking oil and a paper towel to wipe off most of it. And then where it's left in these little crevices, that's minimal. Um, and that, so this is just plain old cooking oil. There's nothing fancy here. It's beeswax, it's demar resin. 
Um, I actually, uh, I, I, I can teach you how to make your own paint. I can teach you how to make your own encaustic medium, or you can choose to buy it. And, you know, that's kind of something that I'm, I'm going to go into simply because um, I've got a lot of people signed up for the master class. And I found out by doing a survey that a lot of them were new and they'd never done encaustic before. So I kind of thought, well, if that were me, I would kind of want to have a, like a beginner sort of like, um, the mini course is what I'm calling it, so that people are prepared and they kind of know what to expect. Yes. If you can hear me, I think right now might be a good time, you know, because we're going to leave room for some more questions. And I know we have we have more creations to do. There's more art to create today. Um, I think it would be great if you could just actually talk a bit about powerful design and personal color, uh, you know, the, the, just to give a little bit about the class. And, you know, we, we can share more at the end, but just at least give a little bit of a primer for the folks who are with us because we're about an hour in. Oh, okay, sure. Um, so Powerful Design and Personal Color um, is an online course that is available for life and it's available 24 seven. And I believe it's like 11 hours long uh, and it includes many different modules, but um, the gist of that course is about laying the foundations in art that you may not have gotten, whether you went to art college or I mean, art school, some people have never had formal training, um, a lot like for in me, like I, I was self-taught for many years and I had gone to many workshops um, back in the watercolor days. You know, it's not that I didn't have good information, I did. But uh, what I realized was that um, I felt like having a course that um, is all in one place and took um, the 30 years of experience that it really did take me to um, understand in a way that, um, you know, color is not so difficult and design is not so difficult, but it's all about finding your own personal voice. And then once you know what it is you want, then really what's cool about that is you can work in any medium. It's not dependent on the medium. What it's really dependent on is you. So I try very hard in the course to help artists um, find that personal voice. And um, in the course, I, they kind of watch over my shoulder on videos. Um, and I paint 16 paintings in four different color palettes. And, um, and then they do the same. And then we have a private Facebook group where everybody posts their work. And it's a wonderful community. I mean, everybody's so supportive. And they post their work. And um, I choose cover images like once a week and feature art and artists. And, um, and then I've done some live workshops as well, um, you know, around the world teaching this and I guess to my surprise and I didn't really know what to expect but um, to my surprise and you know really happy that people are um, able to like uh, get rid of that fear that they had and like I had a lot of fear I had a lot of frustration and um, I, I wasn't consistently getting the results I wanted and um, it wasn't until I I kind of did my own homework and then put the what I learned into this course that I now see others doing the same thing and, and they're really enjoying uh, painting again. Um, and it's kind of one of those things. So that's why today what we're doing is we're playing um, and I, I have um, a various journey that I walk people through called the nine stages of creativity, which I've already done presentations um, through Teachable uh, about that. Uh, but this is the beginning part. And then I walk people, walk people through what it's like to be in the middle stage where I feel like it's kind of a bell curve. That's where it, it can be more difficult to, to move on. You get stuck and you know, what do you do? And so I offer some things to think about and how do you move forward when you're stuck and what are some problem solving things? And then the final area is to clarify, you know, what is it you want to present to your audience? So that's what the course is. Um, okay, so I'm gonna just try to put some kind of a yellowish um, glaze. I don't know, sometimes you can't quite tell how much of a glaze it is until you dip in a test strip. That's something I kind of um, have discovered more recently. Let me just uh, fuse this in before I forget. And the propane, um, it, like in the torch, it does go a really long way. So that's nice. Oh, it's nice and thin. That's kind of what I wanted. So this is very much a layering medium, just like you could say that about any medium, but it's just that it's so it's kind of quick because you're dealing with uh, wax and you're only waiting for the wax to cool. You're not waiting for oil paints to dry. And, you know, so that's just kind of fun to be able to come in the studio. Um, I like to do this sometimes as a warm up and I also love to do 
encaustic monotype. And that's when you actually do this on like rice paper. So 